healthy. And, and what I, my personal belief is, is because in, behind closed doors, there's a lot of people supporting that because they're secretly involved. And uh, a lot of people don't love God. They don't want to be ruled. But God's got the last say. Yes, he will. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. If you're in the neighborhood, love to join us here, as there's a few here this morning. Love to have you here. Or if you're looking for a church, we're at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. And today we are going to begin a new book, and that is the book of Hebrews. So we won't get it finished very soon. We're going to start it today, Wednesday, and possibly Friday. And then I will be gone for two weeks on a short missions trip. And then we'll, we'll resume once I get back. So hopefully you'll stick around. I know I'll probably lose a lot of audience. It seems like recently I've lost a lot of audience because of the fact that I haven't been consistent. Just things getting busy around here and getting ready for this trip. So I apologize for that. And I know this video won't be seen by others till later on and they'll be wondering what, <laughs> what's going on? And of course that's in the past, so interesting. But thank you for joining us. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, as we begin our day today, Lord, we pray that you minister to us as we begin a new book, Lord. May your Holy Spirit, Father, teach us. May he comfort us. And may he lead us today, Father, in the direction that you know is best for us today, Lord. We will be having to encounter people with situations. We may have to pray with them. We may have to encourage them. We may even have to rebuke them, Father, gently, Lord, or just to get things done so that our households continue to run smoothly, Father, whether it's paying bills, running errands, fixing things around the house, Father. Whatever it is, Lord, let us give you glory when we stub our toe that we say, thank you, Jesus, and not other words, Lord. We're just looking, Father, for your spirit to lead us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, good morning. Let's see here. Let me wave to a couple of people. Hi, Patty. We miss you. I love you. Enjoy your time with your grandchildren. <clears throat> All right. So we are in the book of Hebrews. Let me just give you a little introduction here before we get started so we get an idea of what we're reading here of the time and the culture and who the author is. I don't know if you knew this or not, but shortly after AD 100, that is AD 100, 100 years after the birth of Christ, uh, was when they finally added titles to uh, the Bibles, uh, different letters and so forth. So. so before that, there weren't really titles uh, to uh, these letters. They were added later on. So you came to the book of... Um, you know, James, and they didn't really have a name for it. It was just a letter from uh, the disciple James. And so then later on, they said, let's call this one the book of James. Let's call this one the book of Jude. Let's call this one the book of Hebrews. And so that was when they entitled it. And in this epistle here, the title bears the Greek title the uh, to the Hebrews, which was attested by at least the second century, and they all agree that this would be a title that would fit this book, the book uh, to the Hebrews. And the Hebrews were the Jewish people, so you could say to the Jewish people. And within this letter, there is no identification of the recipients as either Hebrew or Jews or Gentiles. There's nowhere in it that it says this is to the Hebrews, this is to the Jews. As far as we know, it could be a historical book written to the Gentiles explaining you know, what the Hebrew culture was like. We really don't know. And to say is just supposition. Um, and since this epistle is filled with references uh, to Hebrew history, religion, and does not address any particular Gentile or pagan practice, the traditional title has been uh, maintained as the book of Hebrews. Uh, it could have been written to the Hebrews without any issues because they would have understood Hebrew culture uh, the Old Testament law, um, the Levitical system, the offering up of sacrifices, and so forth. Uh, so they were very familiar with all of these things. The author of the book of Hebrews is unknown. We really don't know. Um, Paul, Barnabas, Silas, Apollo, Luke, Philip, Priscilla, Aquila, 
and Clement of Rome have suggested, uh, have been suggested by different scholars, but the epistle's vocabulary and various literary characteristics do not clearly support uh, any particular claim. I personally lean towards Paul because Paul was a very uh, religious man when it came to the Sanhedrins. Uh, he was a part of the, not Sanhedrins, but the, yeah, the Sanhedrin groups, which consisted of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Mm -hmm. And he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Gamaliel said that he couldn't give Paul enough books to read. Uh, he prided himself in keeping the law as best as he could. Uh, so I kind of lean that it makes sense that Paul would be the author since he wrote so many of the other uh, letters in the New Testament that it would make sense that Paul was that writer and knowing the law you know intricately uh, uh, it makes sense that Paul would be that that person that authored but again it's just supposition we really don't know who the author is and so to dogmatically say yeah it's Paul you know uh, we don't know it could be Peter some suggest that it's Peter but again they try to pull it out of the text uh, there are some some characteristics to writing that, that can be attributed to a certain individual. Like if you look at my writing, you say, oh, that's definitely Pastor Ruben. Misspelled words, grammar's out of context. Where's the period? It should be here somewhere. Where's the commas and so forth? And why is that letter capitalized and this one's not capitalized and so forth? And you'd know that's Pastor Ruben's letter. So, you, you know, that's what you call textual criticism. You, you, you look at the text and, and you find similarities to other things and you say, okay, that letter definitely has to be a part of this person here. And so to me, it seems like Paul fits that reference, but we really don't know. It is significant that the writers include, includes himself among uh, those people who had received uh, the use of that letter. Oftentimes you see um, them put their name in there, right? The Apostle Paul does that a lot in some of the other letters, but in this case, it's not happening. Now, the use of the present tense. Now, we know in the Greek, the present tense is a continual action, right? So uh, whatever's being said, if it's continual, like uh, believe, for God so loved the world that whoever believes in him has eternal life, that's in the present tense. So whoever continually believes in him, so there's a continual belief in Christ. You have to believe in him every day every day, and the next day, and the next week, and the next year. Uh, you have to continually believe. There is no time when you don't stop believing. Even if it's 20 years from now, you have to continually believe in him, otherwise you won't be saved. Um, so knowing that the, there's a present tense in many of these uh, chapters and scriptures here would suggest that the Levitical priesthood and sacrificial system were still in operation when this epistle was uh, written. So that suggests that the temple had not been destroyed yet because the system was still there and the Jews were still participating in the Levitical law. And then since the temple wasn't destroyed by, uh, at that time until Titus Vaspin of, in AD 70 destroyed it, we have to come to the conclusion that this was written before AD 70. In addition, it may be noted that Timothy had just been released from prison and the persecution was becoming very severe. So all these details suggest a date of 67 to 69, somewhere around there that this epistle was written shortly before the destruction of the temple. And so we have a lot of Jewish uh, verbiage here and, and a lot of uh, the Levitical system that Paul writes. And there are some points that he makes throughout this scripture that's very interesting. And we're going to touch on those as we continue to go through. So let's go ahead and read chapter 1 as we start this new study in Hebrews. Now he begins this, whoever it is, God who at various times and in different ways spoke in times past to fathers, to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the mystery on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So this is the introduction to the book of Hebrews. And, and I love the first part because it's, it's very clear that God spoke at various times in different ways. 
but in these last days he has spoken to us through Jesus Christ. And so we have the Old Testament and how God spoke to us from Genesis, the first five books of the Bible, which is considered to be the Pentateuch. Uh, these were books that Moses wrote and God spoke to Moses. And we see so many references as the Lord said to Moses, as the Lord said to Moses, as the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and so forth. So Paul or, or Moses wrote those first five books. And so through the prophet Moses came those books. And then you can continue to attribute the different letters and books and Psalms and Proverbs and so forth to different authors like Solomon, who wrote uh, several different books uh, like Proverbs, Ecclesiastics, Songs of Solomon, and so forth. And this is the way that God spoke through those people, uh, through him to the people of God and, and others and so forth. So he spoke in various times, but today how does he speak? He speaks through his son. And this is important for us to understand that God doesn't speak any other way. He speaks through his word and it's through his son. Uh, so we have to really get our truth from the scriptures and nowhere else. It's wonderful to have men that study the Bible and get into it and even look at the Greek and the Hebrew. But ultimately, in the end, we all stand before God and he's going to ask us what we did with the Bible how we studied the Bible, how we interpret the Bible. And it really comes down to our own responsibility uh, to be diligent, to study the scriptures and come up with the truth uh, as God has written it. And I really do believe that if you are a child of God and you're a Christian and you have the Holy Spirit, that we're all gonna come up with the same truth because there's only one truth, one absolute truth, and it's very clear. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. And, and if your eyes are open, you'll understand that. If your eyes are closed and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, then that scripture won't make any sense. And I'll give you an example of that. When my father-in-law passed away, <clears throat> I shared that scripture at his funeral service in a Catholic church. And after I had shared that, the priest got up there and then he decided that he was going to interpret it and, and what he said was the correct interpretation, where I said very clearly that Jesus was the only way to get to the Father. And unless you have Jesus Christ, you have not the Father. Well, he said, no, there's many ways. He said that was the intent, that there was many ways to get to. And that's what Jesus was saying, that I am just one way uh, along with many other ways. And so they, again, misinterpret the scriptures. And of course, they then suggest, well, if you knew the original language, you would know uh, that that's what it means. And so now you're depending on him to give you truth. And so now you have two different interpretations, which one is correct? And that's the challenge that we all have. And so knowing the original language, then you can go back to it and you can actually dig into it and realize, okay, no, Jesus is saying adamantly here, there's no other way except through him and that you have to believe in him continually. So, so it's important that we get into the Bible. Um, this past weekend, we... We, um, we talked a lot about what was going on in the world, and there's a couple of guys that are conspiracy theorists. Uh, there's some guys that <clears throat> like to hear theologians on different subjects and so forth, uh, angels, uh, uh, UFOs, uh, aliens, and things like this. Um, I take that group, and they're brothers, and that's the, some, the interest that they have in the scriptures. And that's fine. They are entitled to do, do that. We shouldn't get angry about it. I'm not angry. Um, but I bring, I, I kind of lump them in with those that are also into eschatology, the signs of end times, you know, the events and so forth, which is great. And there's so many signs and, and people pull out things from scriptures and try to make them all fit into a puzzle. And, ah, we're, we're this many days from, from this happening and, and so forth. And I put them also in that group. A lot of that group is all subjective it's not objective and objective you don't know what the definition of objective is it's based upon what is really being said and that's it just what is being said and trying to understand what is being said subjective is where you add to what's being said and you come up with possibilities or what is maybe being inferred and so forth and i believe a lot of this is subjective because you're trying to piece puzzles together and so forth and sometimes you're wrong and there are times when they're wrong, oh, even prophecy and so forth. But what I do find, and this is what bugs me about that, those groups that do this, is they don't do anything for the Lord. They're so busy researching all the, 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 the hoax, you know, and the conspiracy theorists and all of that, and they come up with it and they love talking about it, but they're not doing anything with it. 
They're not out there preaching the gospel. They're not that sharing their faith. They're not, you know, living for the Lord. They're not keeping what is said very clearly. And I used to love what Chuck would always say. When you don't understand something, fall back on what you do understand and just do that. You know, and I think that's the simplest thing to do is you have all these theories, but what are you doing with what Jesus said already very clearly? Are you living for him? You know, are you following his commandments? Are you doing those things that he's already said very clearly? And that's the struggle. Uh, you get a lot of people, they're all hyped up with prophecy, but they're not doing anything with it. They're just staying home and just waiting for the Lord to return. And that's what the Thessalonians were doing. No, we ought to get busy with what we're doing and be involved. So, uh, in these last days, the scriptures is what we go by. Now, <clears throat> looking at verse 5, he says, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, now here we have some questions. And then he's going to answer those questions. But within this conversation, we have the father and we have the son speaking. And it's interesting uh, how they speak to one another um, in reference to who they are as God and as a person. So I think that if our eyes are open, we will see this and we can use this as an opportunity to share with those that don't believe that Jesus is God. You might make a reference to the fact that maybe there's two gods, but that's not what's being said here. There's only one God. And it make, I think it makes it very clear. So here's the question. You are my son, today I have begotten you. What does that sound like? The father begotting the son, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So that's clear. And again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a, to me a son. So very clear. He's the father, Jesus is the son. Jehovah Witnesses get it right. Jesus is the son of God. He very clearly, he's the son of God. Um, they just get it wrong when it comes to him being God. So that's not a debate there. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. So who are we to worship? Uh, Jesus Christ. He came into the world, we're to worship him. We're to worship nobody, guys, not even a man. It is Jesus Christ that we worship. We are not to lift up any man above Jesus Christ. He is our ultimate uh, and, and authority of truth and so forth. And he is our object of worship. Nothing should be worshiped other than Jesus Christ. And he makes that clear again. Even above, He is even above the angels themselves. Mm. Right? Yes. Verse 7. And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels spirits and is ministering a flame of fire? But to the Son, he says... Now, he makes that statement to separate the difference between angels and Jesus Christ. That there's a big difference there. But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. <clears throat> so here's the Father saying to the Son, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The Father calls Jesus God. <clears throat> Very clearly right there, you cannot deny that. That the Father is saying that Jesus is God. Now, he's not saying he's a God. Now, there's no definite article there. But he's God, very clearly, as he is God. So as God, I'm calling you God, and there's only one God because, again, you interpret the Bible by using the Bible. And if you go back to Isaiah, you will find 53, 48, and so forth, right around there. A lot of references to there being only one God, and there will never be any other gods, and there is only one God besides, and there will be no gods besides him. So very clearly <clears throat> that there's only one God. Paul even uses it. One God, uh, there is only one mediator between God and man. That man is Jesus Christ. One mediator, one God. So John, and some make a comment that this might not be in the original text, but the three became one, it says. And it's not, but it's inferred in the text. And if it is a scribal uh, note to it, and he's just interpreting it, he's interpreted it as one God. So it's very clear. So let's go on. But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. Uh, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. So again, now here's the Father God saying, You, God, my Son. So very clear. It would be like... Um, 
if I can give you a, a little picture that, that kind of makes sense, because I know that you might say, well, then there's two gods. That's not what it's saying. That's not what it's saying. It would be like me saying, uh, as a human being, my human son, you know, we can be prosperous, whatever goes on at the end of the sentence, right? As a human, to my human son, because we're all humans, just like their God. So that's the reference here. So it's very clear, and you can use this and then go back to um, Isaiah, uh, John t uh, 10, 30 is a good reference that you can use. John 20, 17, uh, very clear. And then verse, let's see, uh, okay, yeah, that's, that, those are good verses there. So let's move on. So your God, your God and has anointed you. And verse 10, uh, you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will all grow old like a garment. Now, this is reference to Jesus being the creator of everything. Some believe, and wrongly, that Jesus was born into this world, and that he was the Son of God born into this world, that he was not eternal, that once he came into this world, then he learned to be God, so far from the truth. Truth here, the Lord said it very clearly that he in the beginning created all things because he's eternal. So Christ is more than just the son of God. He is God in the flesh. So he has two characteristics or two personalities. If I can say that, I'm not sure if I'm correct, but he is God, divine in every sense of the word and eternal, and yet he is the son of man. He's a human being, uh, which he is eternal, just like we will be one day. Uh, two different thing, functions, and they all both function differently. When he walked among us, he chose not to give in to his divinity, and that was his choice. So in other words, when, when temptation came, when the cross came, when pain came, he, he removed his divinity so that he could feel everything that a human being would feel, because then it wouldn't be fair, right? Because he's God. You know, you strip my back open, I don't feel anything, I'm God. I have no... No sense at all to that. It's not going to affect me because I can change matter and, and do things like this. No, he, uh, he decided that I'm going to feel everything that a human being would feel. So he has that humanity about him. So he can say, and we'll see that as we go through Hebrews, that he was tested and tried at every point. Why? Because as our high priest, he knows what we went through so he can have compassion and love and comfort for us. Very clearly there. Uh, they will perish, but you remain his eternal state, garments of old. Like a cloth... Verse 12, you will fold them up and they will be changed, but you are the same and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? And so uh, Christ is far more above the angels. He is not an angel. He is not a created being. He is eternal. Verse 14, to close, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. So Jesus is the Son of God, but he's also God in the flesh. Amen? Amen. So this book starts off very clearly uh, telling us who Jesus is, describing to us who Jesus is. And I think rightly so, as we get into it, we're going to realize why. Because everything in the Old Testament, from the Levitical system to all the offerings, all point to Jesus Christ. They are a type of Jesus Christ. So he's making it clear. Here, here's the foundation. Uh, here's the emphasis. Here's who we're talking about. Here's the point. It's Jesus Christ who is God in the flesh, the Son of Man. He has come to die for the sins of the world. And we must receive him, accept him as our Lord and Savior. We must surrender our lives to him. We need to allow him to be our ruler and our king, he is the one who leads us and guides us. What do I mean by that, lead us and guide us? Because that is a big problem with the church today. We have a lot of people ruling and guiding their own lives. And I can give you an example from the Old Testament. We have a person called Jacob. And he was born uh, in a battle with his brother. And he came into the world as Jacob. They named him because of the battle that was going on. And he pulled his brother back and they call it Surplanter, uh, one who wanted uh, to be blessed. And then later on, we see him sell his, his uh, soup 
for the brother's birthright. And again, he took that. And so Jacob has always been a person that's ruled by his own passions, his own desires, his, his own wants. Even his mother helped him uh, become uh, the firstborn and receive the blessings from his father, Isaac. Um, so his life has always been dictated by his own desires, right? And that's every man's life and woman's life in the beginning is I'm going to do what I want to do. You know, you grow up in this world, you're born in this world, and your parents are telling you what to do. They feed you, they clothe you, they take care of you, they buy you things. You're pretty much in their hands, right? I mean, you have no say. You don't come out of the womb and say, um, I want my own room. You know, this is how I want it decorated. Uh, this is who I want to bunk with me. No, I don't want my sister there. I don't want my brother there. You don't do that. You, you just do what you're told. And you're given what you're told. And it's all given from love, right? It's all given because they care about you and they're not going to give you bad things. And, and so, and you just receive it. You just receive it and you go along with the thing. And you do that until a certain age. There's a certain age and it's all different with different kids. There's a certain age. It could be six, it could be four, it could be two. A lot of twos. Terrible twos, they call it, right? And all of a sudden you're like, no, I want to do my own thing here. I don't want to eat those. <laughs> throw it off the plate. Throw my spoon on the floor. Give me some candy. You know, I want some candy. And you go in the store and you're pulling the candy stuff off the thing. Because you're doing, no, you don't want that. Now the battle begins. Now your parents are trying to rule you, but you're ruling your own life. Now when we grow up from there. We grow up living like that and believing that. I mean, and there's some truth to that because God created us in his image to know right from wrong and to have a free will. And we grow up there, and so now we're living this life. We become teenagers, and our parents are letting us go because that should be the process. You're, you still now let them make decisions. You let them suffer consequences, and then at 18, you say, get out of here. Don't come back. <laughs> You're on your own. And now they are out of there and they have to have a job, they have to have a home, they have to clean their home and, and do all these things. And they can live the way they want. And usually if they're single, they live pretty much uh, not doing anything because they're tired of doing so much. And so I'm gonna live not washing the dishes, not washing my clothes, my bed messy and things all over the place, I don't care. You know, and then they realize you can't live like that. And then they choose their spouse and so forth. And now they have someone that comes along and says, uh-oh, now I have to make decisions with this person, you know. Then Christ comes into this situation, and now he says, I want to rule. You're like, wow. So Jacob had a choice, and God had to touch the side of his hip, and he says, your name is no longer Jacob, but it's now Israel, and Israel means ruled by God. And so now we have to surrender our will to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, you guide me, you lead me, you rule my life. Oh, yeah, we have choices, you know. It's someone's birthday party and we choose to go to it. But how you live while you're at that birthday party is important. That you reflect Jesus. That you're a light. You pray before your food. You know, the gift that you give them. You write a nice little quote from the scriptures and so forth because you're a witness. And this is where we surrender our lives to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want to be ruled by you now. And that is the struggle of every man and woman is being ruled by God or being ruled by their own passions. Thus creating themselves into a God not ruled by God. And that is the battle that we face today. And so Hebrews says there's only one God, and that is Jesus Christ. And he sits on the throne. He has a scepter. He's the ruler. And everything that has been written points to him as that ruler. And it's our choice to surrender to him. Amen? Amen. So God bless you. Thank you for joining us. I pray that you have a blessed day, that the Lord would be with you, and the Holy Spirit would lead you and guide you. And blessings would just flow from heaven. By grace, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word. When we pray your blessings upon your people as they begin this day. Our Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Talk to you guys on Wednesday at 9 a.m.